we've got to reach the furthest behind first, um, on the energy side in particular. You know, the fact that there are this 1.3 billion who have no access to electricity and the 2.6 billion who cook on open fires, ingest smoke and 4 million die a year. I mean, a huge, um, uh, uh, both, you know, individual family catastrophe when the mother and, and children, because they're near their mother, um, uh, uh, die because of inhalation of indoor smoke. Um, we have the gadgets now. We actually also have the means of payment on mobile phones, tiny amounts. And it's what, that's, what, that's what the poorest pay. They pay for their kerosene and their candles, and they pay a lot of their very small income. Um, how can we scale that? Um, my foundation has been looking into the possibility of using social protection systems and social entrepreneurs and um, philanthropists to try and get in scale to those who are a bit below the market but can actually afford to pay now because they, they may not have electricity but they're likely to have a mobile phone. Um, so, um, you know, the, the, there's different ways in which we have to scale but we have to, I think, um, prioritise those who were left behind by the fossil fuel um, uh, industrialisation. And uh, we, we, we've said expressly um, reaching the furthest behind first, no one left behind, and in Paris um, we cared about vulnerable countries and went for 1.5. So I think that's a, and that's, a, that's a real target for social entrepreneurs and philanthropists to try and see how we can scale. A lot of people in this room are doing it. You know, Bunker Roy and a lot of others are getting um, you know, women as social, um, as the engineers um, to, uh, uh, to do this, women in <coughs> college. But it's, it's not getting to that 1.3 billion out of our world of 7.3 billion. You know, it's a, it's a big proportion. But this is, this is a, a really great point to, to drill in a little bit further on. When we think, when we talk about urgency and then we talk about prioritization, what we're really saying is what, do we, what are the, the actions that we need to take imminently to make this change happen? I would say action number one is if we can absolutely reduce the demand of coal mm. in India and Africa, mm -hmm. that gives us the greatest chance of getting this done. It also happens to fulfill a real need. Mm. It's climate justice, it's, it's fairness. It's all of which we should do. And the good news is we don't need to invent anything else. Mm. It, can, it absolutely uh, can be done. Uh, a second example might be we, if we were... But, but David, if I can, I mean, how does that tie in with your thing that India sees coal as being vital to getting electricity to its poor people? And, you know, they, they're going into solar, but, you know, exactly that point. <clears throat> well, I, I, I would say that we, uh, and, I, and I know that this is one action that has come out of Paris, there mm -hmm. is significant... <clears throat> um, uh, a willingness to exchange technology yes. into into uh, into India and indeed Africa mm. Uh, mm. on on solar itself, okay. mm. but I, I think it's actually you're right to keep pushing on this. Is we we can't just say it. Mm. We have to be very aggressive mm. about delivering mm. on it and recognize again the 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 thing about this is it's urgent. We have to be focused. What are those things that we need to do? This is one thing we need to do. Almost with blinders on, we Absolutely. just need to keep getting it done. So a third rail for for a lot of people, right? And the audience has been carbon pricing, and uh, you know that keeps coming up and keeps going away. Um, is this the right time? I mean, to some extent, you know, a lot of the world would say with oil prices and commodity prices of coal being as low as they are, uh, if not now, when? And what would it take to, to do that? I think we need to use Paris as a springboard for carbon pricing. It has, it speaks to everything we're talking about. Coal creates the kind of damage and pollution to society. Now, we're not yet great as a society in being able to price all of that, but we have got to start doing it. We cannot look at fossil fuels um, in isolation. We've got to look at the implications. And I would say, in the United States, we had one of the largest coal companies um, file for bankruptcy mm -hmm. yesterday. That was no accident. Um, it is no longer economic or viable. But that's the United States, and it's a very different uh, formula. I think, Depender, putting a price on carbon 
is one of the single most important things. I mean, and there are several, I could name five that I think are crucial. But when we put a price, and it's gotta be, a, let's be clear, it's gotta be a real price, a legitimate price, a price that's commensurate with the real cost of fossil fuels. That has the ability to start transferring technology, you know, forcing a transfer of technology. Uh, and it can be done. In the United States, you know, people think we'll never get back to that debate. I think we're ready to. We're bringing unlikely suspects. The conservatives may not want to talk to our colleagues and us from the advocacy community, but they are sitting down, and we have had 15 meetings in the last month uh, with some of the most conservative, well, some of the most reasonable and conservative people uh, in the Congress, bringing financial leaders and business leaders into those discussions. We can change that debate. I don't think it's going to happen in the next six months during a crazy presidential campaign. Uh, but that debate and discussion has to be happening everywhere. Uh, we need a legitimate price on it. By the way, uh, I mean, no, no, no surprise that the coal industry is going through what it is, right? I don't know if you've seen the latest numbers. Um, uh, Vice President Gore shared a lot of statistics yesterday. One piece I found in one of his other talks and uh, dug up was that the top four coal companies in the U.S., their market cap cumulatively has declined 99% since 2011, you know, from $32 billion dollars. $270 million. So, you know, clearly that industry is, is, is going through that and it's not going to be easy to, to give up on that. But we didn't expect that five years ago and we didn't necessarily expect that 33 hmm. years ago. But the coal industry is on the decline and on its way out in the United States and we'll move that further. The fossil fuel industry, oil and gas, 50 of the largest investors internationally have called on the 40 largest fossil fuel companies immediately after Paris to do a financial stress test. Yeah. Show me what you're mm. going to look like as an industry in a 2 degree and a 1.5 degree world. Mm. Show us what the financial outlook is for your company. Mm. And the debates, we have been in the conference rooms, we have organized the discussions between investors and fossil fuel companies. Uh, they are realizing, they may not admit it publicly, but they are realizing their future looks very different if we're going to a two-degree world. But, but this is another uh, way that we are going to get a price on carbon. So there's, there's two, well, there's really three actions that, that, that will drive this. The first, and Al talked about it, uh, I wasn't there, but I, I've seen his speech before. <laughs> uh, <laughs> in fact, I think I could do his speech. <laughs> Not as well, I hasten to say, but I could probably, I've got to memorize this point. The, the, the technology change is happening. It is yes. going to happen. We see significant cost down curves in multiple alternative energies. It's, it's going to happen. Secondly is, is, of course, the price. But third, actually, is disclosure. And increasingly, investors, as Minnie was saying, are, are asking for understanding what the, the carbon risk is in, in businesses and, by extension, their, their portfolios. It's not an accident. Uh, that the coal industry in the United States has suffered significantly because actually I would say the divestment campaign uh, that is now global has was able to raise this question and investors started saying well actually maybe we should think about whether there is a risk here and they concluded that there was and I'm not that smart but if you have more sellers and buyers things tend to go down mm -hmm. and that's ultimately what's mm -hmm. happened and we will now pivot that discussion to the hydrocarbon based mm -hmm. businesses mm -hmm. and I think Mark Carney um, as was, in the um, central bank here has, has uh, you know as, as that a big my understanding is that there is a, a beginnings of a real dialogue between regions now on trying to build a bottom-up Mm. price on carbon. Absolutely. And uh, the EU is talking to China, um, California, Quebec and uh, British Columbia. Mm -hmm. you know, in other words, we're getting that critical mass because the problem, as I understand it, is that um, you've got freeloaders, <coughs> countries who wouldn't put a price on carbon and, and people have been afraid of that. But I mean, given that we've been talking about it for a while, it's about time it happened. <laughs> and I think we need this club of, con of countries that are going to move on it. And of course, the United States, if it can move, it would be really impressive. I think, so, I mean, if I can just say, I think Mindy's um, spot on though. I mean, I think that the, the big opportunity there is, is that it precipitates a huge transfer in technology to the developing world and to the vulnerable world. Um, 
and I think one of the, and it's a, and it's a two-way street, I hasten to add, but I think one of the problems in uh, looking at uh, the technology, the renewable energy technologies in these uh, developing and vulnerable countries is that, um, uh, yes, there's an urgent need and, and yes, there's a kind of moral imperative that those at the back should get that first. Um, what's often missing is the fact that it's also just a great opportunity. Um, mm -hmm. and, uh, and I say that it's a two-way street because I, I don't think that's just something that um, the investment community, which is not a community that I'm um, at all uh, uh, au fait with to the same extent that David and others are, but, but I think it's also something that a lot of vulnerable and developing countries um, uh, miss, uh, lose sight of in the sense that they too often look to the multilateral funds or they too often look to their mm -hmm. traditional donor countries um, for a traditional aid to help them build something uh, to adapt or to build them something that will help them reduce their emissions. Um, and in fact, there's actually huge opportunities. And one of the, you know, one of the opportunities that the Marshall Islands has really latched onto, sitting as they do on the equator, uh, is a technology called ocean thermal energy conversion, which mm -hmm. takes the difference in the temperature of the water at the bottom of the ocean uh, to that on the surface. And given that they're on the equator, uh, they've got a very stable temperature. And they've also got, uh, as an atoll, they've also got a, a, a drop off to the bottom of the ocean very near their shore. Uh, which means that they're the best site in the world for there to be an ocean thermal energy mm. conversion plant. Uh, but it's hard for them to get an investor to take notice because there's not necessarily um, the demand for it. You know, there's only 60,000 people there and to build an ocean thermal energy conversion plant for 60,000 people who don't use a lot of electricity um, is not the world's greatest investment decision. That said, they have a US military base and they use a lot of power with their radar systems. But more importantly, it's a testing ground. If you can develop a small new transformational technology such as that in an island, it, has, it is able to be replicated um, in hundreds of countries, well, in, in at least 100 countries around the world who have, uh, who have a coastline. So there's, there's not only huge opportunities uh, to do these projects and to build these projects in these developing and vulnerable countries, but they're also great testing grounds for a lot of these technologies. Mm. So, so new technologies versus you know, the technologies that are already on a good roadmap, uh, technologies that are already past the tipping point, David, uh, balance between investing in new technologies versus deploying what we have and taking advantage of some of those curves we saw yesterday. You know, solar's dropped 80 to 90% in the last 10 years. Seems to be, seems to be what we need, um, investing in one versus the other. Any thoughts? In terms of whether it's better to invest in sort of our current technology yeah. or... Deployment uh, versus development of new technology. I think so. it's, it's all of the above, mm -hmm. actually. <laughs> uh, we're, we're certainly going to... Yeah. So I'm very optimistic that if we invent z nothing else between now and the, in the next 10 years, if we just deploy what we have, we will make significant progress. Mm -hmm. But it's also clear that we will need to continue to innovate. But innovation is, is across the, the broader economies, or broader industry segments, and we have innovation. There's no question yep. about that. And so I'm, I'm confident that we will mm -hmm. have innovation too. But what, what I don't think we need is to say, my goodness, let's stop until we sort it Think of something else. Uh, we can store carbon somewhere. Um, I think we can just get going. Yeah. Well, what's interesting, if you look at the intended nationally determined commitments, contributions, INDCs, the commitments that people made before Paris, 188 countries had made them before the Paris um, Agreement. Um, many of the developing countries want to go more renewable. In fact, some of them want to go entirely renewable by very early dates. But Talking to some of the small island states and the most vulnerable countries, you know, my role as special envoy before uh, Paris, um, they have real problems of getting private finance. Mm -hmm. um, they're heavily indebted, some of them, especially the small islands, the Caribbean islands, and they, um, they, they, they just don't have a link, and the, nobody's taking that risk out enough. Uh, I know the Commonwealth is trying now with a, with a, um, a hub uh, to, to reach them, but it, we, we shouldn't underestimate that it's going to be difficult, uh, and if we don't get that investment and the technology, they just can't do it. And so I think that we're going to have to be more innovative and more maybe risk-taking because we know that it will be better for the countries in the world. And, there are, you know, and it, 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 it's good business uh, to move to, to renewables. But I, I would urge the investment community to understand the problems 
of least developed countries and small island states who want to go renewable and find it very difficult to get the investment. Yep. So, Depender, I, I'm going to follow up on that and almost put a challenge to you at the, the great minds of Capricorn <laughs> and others, and there are indeed some great minds I bet there. he didn't expect that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad I have my partners here with me. Yeah. <laughs> uh, one thing we hear every day, 20 times a day, is there's lots of capital out there, and there are a lot of opportunities for that capital. Uh, but they don't mix, they don't match. Mm -hmm. The capital is for X kind of things, <laughs> the projects out here in India have higher risk, which of course they do. Um, the large institutional investors who we work with don't like risk at all and they have to get a certain return. Uh, so we've got capital, we've got projects and needs. Uh, there's something needed in between and there are a few people talking about it, but we need a bigger way of not only it's not having the right technology. It's having the right financial mousetraps. You know, uh, David used to be at Goldman Sachs, and I was in there uh, a couple of weeks ago and said, you guys know how to develop a mousetrap for anything, an investment vehicle for A, B, C, or D. Mm -hmm. um, what we need is the financial community to come together. And, and the burden ought not to all be on the financial mm -hmm. community. They have a set of rules. They need to make money. We could talk about return. but. I don't think we're overthrowing a system that exists. I think we're working within a system, but how to get it to work for the real mm -hmm. needs that have to be met. Mm -hmm. And we need government in. How do we de-risk certain investments exactly. in India? Uh, there are investors who have money, they want to be in the renewable energy space, but they're worried about this or they're worried mm -hmm. about that. This is not inventing new technology that nobody's understood mm -hmm. and it takes you know, an astrophysicist like Jan to come up with a new mass trap. Uh, we need the financial gizmos, for lack of a more technical term, that match the kind of needs with the kind of capital. And it may be government coming in and taking the early risk in an investment. It may, there are all sorts of ways mm. to do it. It's not my expertise. I won't come up with those brilliant ways, but you guys can. And how do we match capital to the needs and to the projects that need the capital now? Yeah. So there's a reason why they have me on this side, because if I was on that side, it would take four hours. Um, but <laughs> but uh, I mean, this is a topic uh, very near and dear to our hearts. Uh, uh, you know, uh, I agree with David. Uh, uh, we need all of the above. Uh, there is a lot of innovation that has happened. You heard about some of them yesterday. Uh, lots of technologies are past the tipping point. Uh, you know, in more than 70% of the world, solar is grid parity, which is a wonderful thing. That means we don't need to sit around and admire it for too long. Um, and there will be lots more innovation. You know, Silicon Valley is not going away. The kind of cost curves that uh, the vice president showed yesterday are just going to continue, and and uh, a lot will 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 continue to happen there. But there's a fair amount of stuff that's ready to be deployed. Um, I think there is a shortage of capital uh, in the space. Uh, you know, everybody that I talk to in the space, you know, says they could deploy multiples of the capital that is being deployed today in in their respective areas. The the specific one that you talk about, which is you know certain countries, India, for example, I think the biggest issue is the cost of capital. There's a huge uh, barrier today if you compare their sovereign. Uh, debt rates versus what we have in the U.S. That reflects directly on the cost of power. Uh, it's almost pro exactly proportional to the cost of capital. So uh, I know there was a lot of discussion around that. That was probably, if you had to pick the single biggest yeah. thing yeah. Uh, that could happen would be uh, to, to do something creative mm. in that space to, to bring the cost of capital down. And, um, and, and I think then you'll see a huge exactly. unlocking mm. of that. And I don't know if you have anything to add to that. Too. I guess I would add, um, and again, thinking about prioritization, and, and I agree with, with Mary that we we need to be focused on the the poorer regions of the world, and, and it's both for justice and opportunity mm. uh, perspective. But in terms of prioritizing, we might also want to look at, at businesses that are beginning to emerge and and encourage those businesses to be successful. And the difference today versus 2012 in terms of, of examples of successful businesses is night and day in the transition to low carbon economy. Remember four or five years ago, 
uh, the whole notion of, of sustainability, the whole notion of clean technology was under great, uh, uh, great siege or, or, or great, uh, I guess, skepticism. There were a lot of bankruptcies in the United States. There were very few examples of excellent businesses. That's different today. Mm -hmm. Whether it be Nest, whether it be Solar City, whether it be Tesla, whether it be Mcopa in, in Kenya, there are a number of examples of very successful businesses that are addressing these challenges. And there's many more behind them. And as investors begin to see success stories, money will, will follow. Mm -hmm. okay. By the way, um, we will be opening up for questions here in a few minutes, but you also have some 3x5 cards in case you don't want to ask your question on mic, please fill those out and uh, we have people who will collect them and bring them up, uh, but we will open up uh, for questions. So um, shifting gears a bit uh, to the time frame, uh, Mindy, you made the point, you know, all of this is fine, but this needs to happen quickly and, and in the time frame. Um, you can talk a little bit about you know, what your thought is, how can we make this happen in the time frame required and maybe use the U.S. as an example. You know, what do you think can happen in the U.S. in the next uh, couple of years uh, to really lead in this effort? Well, uh, since I've been here in Oxford, I've had many questions. Tell me really what's going on in this presidential campaign. <laughs> uh, and do half the candidates really think climate change doesn't exist. So I am living a little bit in Never Never Land until this presidential debate <laughs> is over. But um, to ground it, I do think we need to change the debate and change who the advocates are in the United States for whatever reason if environmentalists or scientists or are not the ones who have the credibility within the Congress now. We need to take the hundreds and hundreds of business leaders and financial leaders who say they're acting and are acting. They're committing to 50% carbon reduction, 100% renewables, or something in that, or many other sustainability practices that, by the way, are helping their bottom line and making them stronger and more financially viable. But we need to change the debate. They need to become step up and become the spokespeople. We've got things like the Chamber of Commerce, places that represent the business community, or so they say, uh, opposed to any changes. Uh, we need the financial and business community to say we support a price on carbon or a policy change. Uh, the United States must, must deliver on Paris. Right now, the biggest um, driver of that is something called the Clean Power Plan mm -hmm. to bring utility emissions down and it's stuck in the United States Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. So we're gonna to have to find the opportunities for real change. There's a fuel economy standard rule that says cars need to average 55 miles per gallon. Some are gonna try and roll that back. We need to fight and make sure those things stay in place. So one big thing in the United States and elsewhere is gonna be when we get policy change or a price on carbon, I think we'll see a faster turnaround of what's going on. But the viability of the fossil fuel industry, and we haven't talked that much about the fossil fuel industry, but they are the strength and the driver and the reason that we're not passing the kind of policy changes we need. Uh, we didn't expect to see the coal industry in the United States truly on its knees. We are now seeing fossil fuel companies being threatened on what their future looks like based, uh, based on um, carbon pollution. So, I think big changes, for the last 10 years, we've seen fossil fuel companies put about $650 billion a year in new capital expenditures in more fossil fuels. Even though we've already got enough fossil fuels than we could ever burn, and, and much more so. The number of assets that are stranded that will never be burned are already extraordinary. Um, what we are starting to see is some of that capital being pulled out of new fossil fuels. Enough, no, we need to sit here, as David said, if we're here three or four years making the same argument, we're in trouble. But the fossil fuel industry investments in new and more fossil fuels over the next five years has just dropped from about 650 to about 400 billion. Well, that's a start, but we need to get, stop that money flowing to tar sands and the arguments about drilling in the Arctic uh, and I think over the next five years, we'll see substantial change in that space. Yeah. Could I point yes, to a, um, a different timescale? Yes. Um, 
part of the work my foundation is involved in now is putting more focus on intergenerational equity. Yes. And we've noted that um, before Rio, um, Rio Plus 20, um, there was quite a movement to have some kind of an oversight body, either a commission for future generations or a high commissioner for future generations, to make sure that we bent that curve and kept it bent for future generations. And we now have what seems to some people, particularly in the political world, to be a long-term agenda, the 2030 agenda. That's not long-term. <laughs> uh, <you know? laughs> um, and, and, and we have to make it a domestic agenda. Those 17 goals are part of, you know, internal domestic US law, uh, US um, policy, um, UK, Ireland, etc. And we have to live by those sustainable goals with the 1.5 as part of that. But we also have to be aware that we need to kind of have a, a concern for the staying within the planetary boundaries, which we are at the moment exceeding. And what that might mean, I like your, your analogy of the bus and we would throw ourselves in front of it. We need an oversight body that keeps us on the right sort of way of that bus. <laughs> you know, that in other words, uh, we just need to be aware that there is such an urgency in this, not to frighten people, but to constantly remind that um, not only have we not bent it enough for the 2030 agenda, we're not bending it enough for future um, equity for future generations. Yeah. And I would really like to see us get back to um, some kind of a commission for future generations, commissioner body um, uh, at the UN level, but it could be quite a, a, you know, a loose, innovative kind of body. It doesn't have to be a big, big institution, but an oversight, um, a good body, I think would be, would be really important. Yeah, I think, I think that's a great point. And, and by the way, uh, you know, yesterday's opening video theme was about word pairs. I think President Robinson has kind of a nice ring to it. Um, <laughs> if, uh, if Arnold Schwarzenegger was successful in getting the Constitution modified, would you consider uh, becoming a naturalized citizen of the US? <laughs> I'm president of my foundation. That's enough. <laughs>